Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. Welcome to this week's episode. I'm going to be looking at this flower. Not the primroses underneath, which is where we started this series, but at these purple flowers that are hovering above them. The primroses just seeded themselves into this bit of lawn, but I actually planted the little dry, fragile bulbs of these fritillaries uh, myself. And these are now a few years old and they're thickening up nicely and they're just growing in the grass and they're quite happy to do that. The proper name is a snake's head fritillary and it's the county flower of Oxfordshire so they're quite common in Oxfordshire. You find them growing in very wet meadows. This part of the lawn is quite wet and they're, and they're pretty happy here although it's not a proper water meadow so they're not as fussy as they're sometimes made out to be. The colour is, uh, well, not everybody's cup of tea. They've often been described as mournful and melancholy, and that used to be one of their traditional names, the melancholy fairy they were even described as. So this purple colour is not to everyone's taste. If you look inside them, you can see the classic arrangement of anthers and uh, the stigma in the middle, and the bees like them, so they do get visited by, by pollinators. Now this is the normal form, the purple form, but if we move sideways a little bit, you'll see there's a white form there. And in every population of snake's head fritillaries, there are always white ones. Perhaps 10 or even 20% of the flowers are white. Now that's pretty unusual actually. It's not that uncommon to occasionally have a white form of some plants. Uh, but to have it at such a high frequency, to have 10 or 20% of them be white, that requires a special explanation. So we're trying to understand how the white fritillary is able to persist at around 1 in 10 individuals. Well, that's my estimate from my own garden. And to understand that, we're going to have to think about its genetics. And to understand that, I'm going to start with some Lego. This is a Lego spaceship from the Star Wars series that my son made and we bought him a kit and the kit came with all the bricks inside and an instruction manual. And here's the instruction manual. And this tells you exactly how to put all the bricks together so that you can make the starship that you want. And organisms, whether they're humans or fritillaries, also have an instruction manual. We can't see it, but it's inside of them and it's inside their cells and we call it a genome. And what's unusual about the instruction manuals or the genomes of most organisms is it's actually doubled up. So you actually have two copies of the manual that work together seamlessly. And you've got one copy of the manual from one of your parents and you've got the other copy from the other parent. And that's exactly the same for the fritillaries. All right, so you have two copies of the instruction manual. That means you have two copies of every single instruction. And the single instructions are called genes. And I want to think about the gene that makes the purple pigment that makes those flowers purple. So let's focus in on that. So I'm going to imagine that this is what the instructions, the genes look like for the purple individuals. So they have two copies of an instruction or a gene that makes that purple pigment. And they have two copies of that, one from each parent. Now, sometimes when individuals are born, there are mistakes in one copy of the manual. Mistakes just arise all the time. We call those mutations. This mutation is called a loss of function mutation because this gene doesn't work anymore and it can't make the purple pigment. 
That might not be too bad for this individual because it still has a copy of the gene that does allow it to make the purple pigment, so it may look entirely normal. We sometimes call these individuals carriers. They're carrying broken genes, but they don't have any visible effect. But those individuals may be passing on genes, which means that sometimes an individual is born with two broken copies of a gene, and that can be very serious for that individual. In this case, what it might mean is that the fritillary is white, because neither copy of that gene can make the purple pigment, and so the, the, the flower ends up white. Now, what about the fitness of these individuals? How successful are they going to be? Well, if the red and the white were exactly the same fitness, and, the, and these ones always looked purple, then we'd actually expect the white ones to be at around 25%. That's a bit too high. I don't think they're quite as common as that, more like 10, which suggests that the white ones are not quite as successful as the purple. So that's why I've pushed them down a bit. Perhaps they don't produce as many seeds. Perhaps they don't attract as many pollinators. And if that's true, actually, we would expect the white one to become really quite rare because every time there's two copies of the, of the non-functional gene together, that individual doesn't do very well. So those genes are not passed on. So it's a little bit too high frequency to imagine that this is what's happening. So the key to this lies in these individuals, in the carriers. So we've assumed here that they are just as good as the, the individuals who have two copies. It may be that they're even worse, that they have a disadvantage, in which case this non-functional gene will be lost very rapidly from the population and these individuals will be really rare. But just sometimes, these carrier individuals can actually be more successful than the individuals with two functional copies of the gene. And you may know of a condition in humans called sickle cell anemia, where this happens. It's the haemoglobin gene, not a purple, which is still a pigment gene, but something that's very important in humans for carrying oxygen around the body. And if you live in an area with a lot of malaria, then having a normal haemoglobin gene and one sickle cell gene can protect you against malaria, despite the fact that if you get two copies of the broken gene, you're really in trouble. And so it's entirely possible, although I have no idea and I'm just guessing, that this is what's happening with the snake's head fritillary. Perhaps those individuals with one functional gene and one broken gene are actually more successful than those ones. And if they are, then they would be able to maintain the white fritillaries at a higher frequency in the population. And this is just a general mechanism that can go on. Nobody studied the fritillaries well enough to know that that's what's happening here. OK, well, we're going to go back outside and think about a second mechanism that might also maintain those white fritillaries. So the second explanation about why those white fritillaries are able to persist at quite high frequency, we need to think harder about what that purple pigment that the purple fritillaries are making really does. And it is a type of pigment called an anthocyanin. And most plants produce those. And this Acer is an example of a plant that's producing it right now. And I hope you can see that the leaves are not green. These are the brand new leaves coming out in spring and they're heavily tinged with reddish purple colour. And that is caused by anthocyanins. And if you look around your garden now at lots of plants that are putting out new leaves, whether it's peonies, roses, they're often very heavily red and purple. They don't really look green at all, some of them. Why are they producing those pigments, which are probably expensive for the plants to produce? Well, it seems that they have some protective function. They can protect the new leaves against all kinds of things, frost, for example, which can happen late in the year unexpectedly, but also damage by insects and pests and possibly even diseases. So if, once we know that, that might help us to understand the fritillaries a little bit better. So I'm just going to go next to those now and have a think about that. So these purple fritillaries, the purple coloration is not confined to the flower. I won't try to zoom in on this too much, but the stems, because it's difficult to see, but the stems are also quite heavily purpled. Whereas the white one doesn't have any of that. So it just can't produce those anthocyanins, it seems. So the question is, that could be a benefit to the white ones. The anthocyanins are expensive to produce. So if it doesn't produce them, it might actually be more successful than the purple ones. But that might only work 
when it's rare, okay? And if we just take a look at the whole population now, imagine that the purple ones, because they're producing anthocyanins, are resistant to a pest or a disease that might sweep through that population. And the white one at the moment, because there's only one of it, can hide amongst these resistant ones. It's benefiting from something that we call herd immunity. And you might have heard a lot about herd immunity in the context of the coronavirus. Now the problem for the white one is that okay, so at the moment it's fine, and it might even be doing better than the purple ones, and its frequency might then increase. But if it increases too much, you'd have a lot of white ones and only a small number of purple ones, and the herd immunity is now lost. And a disease or a pest might sweep through that population and kill all the white ones or severely damage them. And so you get this thing called frequency dependence. When the white one is rare, it might have an advantage. But if it becomes too common, it then gets a disadvantage. And that is a general mechanism that can keep um, a second type of individual in a population at a low frequency. And that might be what's going on with these white fritillaries. I honestly don't know because I don't think anyone studied it carefully enough. But it's definitely a possibility. So let's look at the population again and just think about that herd immunity concept because you're probably hearing a lot about it. The white vulnerable individual here can benefit from the herd immunity. Now we as a population are like, we're like a big population of white fritillaries at the moment. None of us have ever had coronavirus. We're all vulnerable. But as that disease comes through the population, you can imagine the white fritillaries turning purple as people get the disease, recover and become resistant. And that's what we're trying to build in the population. We're hoping that enough of us get it and recover from it and become resistant that we can offer protection to the very vulnerable, to the white fritillaries among us who perhaps just aren't, are, are so vulnerable because if they got it, it'd be so dangerous for them. And the government initially decided they'd just try to let that thing happen naturally. The problem for us with coronavirus is it's too dangerous, even for people who are apparently healthy. You just can't know if you get it, will you just recover and be fine and now resistant, or will you end up in hospital? And so they're having to manage the course of this disease, keep us at home, try to delay the transmission uh, so that the NHS can actually cope with the number of sick people. But in the end, that's what we want to do. And of course, the very best way to build resistance and turn us all into purple fritillaries is to have a vaccination. That is by far the safest way to have herd immunity in a population. So let's all keep our fingers crossed for all those hardworking people out there who are trying right now, including some of my colleagues at Oxford University, to develop a safe and effective vaccine. So just to finish, what can you be looking out for in your garden this week? Well, have a look around and I bet you'll be able to find quite a few white versions of various common plants. In my garden, there are white forget-me-nots. In amongst the blue ones, there are white snake's head fritillaries in among the purple ones. And there are white bluebells in amongst the blue ones. Gardeners really like having unusual colours of plants and those loss of function mutations that knock out the anthocyanins are quite common creating white forms of different flowers which gardeners then seize upon and grow if you're really lucky you might find an even more unusual color mutant and some people have made a lot of money out of that by then selling it to the garden industry so worth keeping your eyes peeled